Hola, amigos! Welcome back to Rewild Ology, where we explore conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and world traveler. In this week's episodes, we're traveling to South America and the beautiful Galapagos Islands to chat with my phenomenal friend, Josie Cardoso. Josie is a naturalist guide for the Galapagos National Park and is very active in her local community. In part one, we chat about what COVID has done to the islands and how she's been killing time while she waits for tourists to return, what it's like growing up and working in an isolated paradise, and why she decided to open a boutique hotel with her mother on Santa Cruz Island. I really didn't want this conversation to end because it was so good. I hope you enjoy it just as much as me. If you're liking the show so far, please subscribe and share wherever you're listening. Sharing is the best way to help the show grow, and I promise to continue bringing on fascinating guests and sharing their inspiring stories. So now let's get to my conversation with Josie. My first question, how bored are you right now? From the scale one to 10? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, To be honest, until October, I was minus 100, Mm. I think. (laughs) That's how bored I was. And right now, these last months that uh, we'll be having some tourists here and there, uh, more freedom to go out with friends. So I would say I'm about five. A five? Hey! I'm still bored, though. That's that's a super big swing. That's awesome. So yeah. um, being in such an isolated place, I mean, because I mean, for me, like being in a pretty big city here in the US, like, I mean, COVID was pretty boring for me as well. So how exactly did the islands handle it? Was it just no one allowed in, no one allowed out? Like, how, what was that situation? Yeah, just let me tell you, Brooke, I decided 10 years ago not to watch TV at all. Mm, so I'm usually not informed of what is going on in the world, usually. And all the news that I need to know, our guests, our my friends will inform me of what, because, you know, when we get into meetings, they're talking about it. And I was like, oh, really? When did that happen? <laughs> so I decided 10 years ago not to watch TV due to the... Um, uh, to the president that we had at that time that was brainwashing us uh, while you were watching TV. So I say, no, no, I mean, that cannot be possible. It's all bad news. So why taking that bad energy early in the morning or at any time of the day? So no TV for me. Great. Advice. And I remember that I was leading some trips in uh, Baja. Uh, we were very isolated in a camping area and people were talking about a virus. But I say, you know, it's it's another virus and I don't want to know about that. So I was doing like nothing was happening. And then late after we were done with the season, I was going back to Los Angeles and staying some days there because I had to do a wilderness first responder training. And then is when a, my friend that I was staying with said, Josie, hopefully your training is going to happen because we're having this virus and it's spreading so fast. So once I got to LA, that was about 9th, 8th of March, I say, okay, hopefully my training will happen because here in Ecuador, we don't have those trainings that often and it is so complicated to to make it match with our calendar. So at the end, we had the training and then my friend said, Josie, Josie, I hope you can go to Ecuador because the flights are not, you know, leaving as they used to to do. I say, well, yeah, Mm -hmm. I hope I can leave. You know, I have a, a trip to start in a few days in Quito and I was able to leave. Of course, the airport was empty. LAX was no one there. I, I was kind of only me and a couple of other people. So I said, hmm, something is really going on. I think I need to watch news or get informed of what's going on in the world. And then I arrived to Quito. I met the group and the group was talking about it. I said, you know, Galapagos and Ecuador has not closed yet. And that was the 14th of March. And the 15th, we, we flew to Ecuador. It was the 14th, the 15th, uh, sorry, to, to Galapagos. And then I started getting messages in my phone saying, maybe Ecuador is going to close. Maybe no planes are going to be able to land in Galapagos. But I got those messages when we were already landing in Galapagos. So I said, okay, mm. we need to get the stuff from our airplane and go to our boat <laughs> because I prefer us to be in the middle of the ocean like, you know, enjoying the islands that get it stuck here at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we did. 
And the next plane behind us was not able to land. It was sent back to Quito. So I was like, oh, good, we made it. And uh, once we get back on board uh, to, yeah, to the boat, I told the captain, hey, le- lift anchor and let's get out of here because I prefer to be visiting the islands, snorkeling, swimming, walking, than being stuck here in the main harbor doing nothing. So that's what we did. And uh, a long story short, we, we had to find flights for the guests. So the guests left the 16th after two days. I mean, we enjoy the islands two days at least. And then they flew to the mainland and flew to back to the States. And the 17th, Ecuador closed its borders, the 16th or the 17th. That was the last flights going out. So in Galapagos, we were shut down since the 17th of March uh, for tourists, you know, guests coming until the 3rd of August. That was the first airplane that landed here. In between March and August, we had humanitarian flights bringing people from the mainland, like uh, people from Galapagos, like local residents that were stuck in the mainland, coming little by little to the islands because it matched the school break, you know, the big school break of two months, the vacations for the kids, it matched at COVID time. So a lot of people, a lot of people from Galapagos were stuck in the mainland. Wow. So those were the only flights that we were having people of coming in and trying to get the few tourists that were stuck here going out. So those March, April, May, June, we were locked down. We were not able to go out of our houses at all. I mean, wow. only like, a, yeah, only it was a stream necessary to go out. But we had, you know, the vegetable truck coming. And we had some stores open. So people would only go for food supplies. So we were very frustrated here with my mom that we are workaholics. You know, we like yes. to be active from the 24 hours of the day, 27, we're doing this stuff. <laughs> That's how, we, how busy we usually are. So it was very hard for us. Very, very hard. And the 3rd of August, because we have a little hotel as well, uh, we had our first guests from the mainland staying on our little hotel. So that since then, it has started moving slowly. You know, maybe since October, November, about 10% occupancy rate, 15%, which is still nothing, right? But it gives you hope to to continue. So that's how we manage COVID, uh, the lockdown here and how the island opened. So for me, in general, Ecuador managed very well the, the problem, you know, close the borders right away. We were one of the first countries in South America to close borders. And um, of course, then uh, the virus is spread in the big cities. Uh, we had a lot of people dying, but as in any other country in the world, you know. So, and the islands have managed very well. We have safety protocols um, and uh, we have some cruise boats going around. The good thing is that here, the cruise boats are not the thousand, hundreds, hundreds yes. passenger boats. Here it's 16 passengers. And the boats that started moving right away on September were the diving boats. Divers were coming because it's the whale shark season. So we had several diving uh, boats going around. Uh, until now, actually, we have divers. Divers are the brave ones to come yeah. here <laughs> and kind of be moving. <laughs> they have a little bit more adrenaline going through their veins. They're like, I'll, I'll risk it. I got a negative COVID test. Let's go to the Galapagos. <laughs> Exactly. And then you're in your little bubble of, you know, 10, 14, 16 guests on board of the boat. And everybody comes in with a negative PCR test and you are isolated in that bubble. And also regular uh, cruise boats, the ones that uh, you do not do diving, but you explore the islands are also going around. And land-based tourism, like us, that we have a hotel, we have people coming and doing daily trips. There are a few daily trips available, but they are. I mean, they are going around and uh, we have uh, guests. So for me, is, I mean, Galapagos is always great to visit. We don't have that many people around because how we manage the tourism. But right now it's empty. So it's even the best time to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so whenever this goes out, everybody go to the Galapagos, stay at Josie's hotel, take some day trips, get your <laughs> negative test first, of course. But... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let's get the islands back hopping again. Oh, that's ex- I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Um, since 
it just, it's just been very interesting as I connect and, and catch up with just some of my friends around the world, how different governments have decided to take you know, care of COVID as best to their abilities, and then how it's affected like local economies. Um, so that that's my kind of my next question. So, I mean, you own a hotel, you and your mother have this beautiful little hotel. It's super cute, this boutique hotel. Um, how has that gone through all of this? That has, I mean, obviously you're still running, so that's a really good thing. Has there been like a government support to help with that? Have a lot of businesses shut down? Because I mean, one of the main sources of revenue for the islands, right, is tourism. So how has that been balanced through all of this? Yeah, uh, here in the Galapagos, the 80% of the people works directly with tourism, right? And the other 20% works indirectly with tourism. So you can imagine how devastated was all this uh, COVID and is, is still going on, right? Uh, most of us were doing nothing, just sitting around and, 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 and waiting. Because uh, that's when you realize we cannot depend on tourism 100%. And now you're thinking, okay, what else can we do in order to be creative and reinvent ourselves? But uh, being on, on an island, that uh, it's, it's complicated. We have fishermen. You know, the other 20% I was telling you is a fisherman. I mean, and they are the ones that have been working, uh, bringing us fish, you know, in the tough times that we had limited supplies. Uh, we have people that work to the land in the agricultural sector, uh, producing some fruits and vegetables. Our main problem is that we don't have enough water to, to produce as much as we would love to produce. So we always have to bring things from the mainland. And then uh, the other people is people that work in the public institutions. The good thing is that they've always had a salary at the end of the month. They are the, uh, the ones that have not been laid off by the government because that's one of the things that government said, okay, no one is going to be laid off, so at least there is money moving the economy. Um, so now, in terms of uh, who's open, who's not, I mean, a lot of businesses shut down. Um, a lot of hotels are closed because they cannot afford, you know, here in Galapagos, everything is more expensive, like in Hawaii, being far away from the mainland, not being self-sufficient, everything has to be imported. So hand labor is expensive, uh, vegetables and fruit is expensive. So they have not been able to afford to open their business again. So a lot of restaurants close down, a lot of shops close down. So if you go in the main street here in the waterfront, there, it used to be more stores closed. Right now, like uh, yesterday, I was wandering around town in the waterfront. Now the souvenir shops are open because we're having wow. some guests. Restaurants that survive are open. Uh, so we're trying, you know, we're, a government has not helped at all. We, we don't have the economy that you have, for example. So once you are laid off, you are laid off and that's it. You know, it's not like you have a, a salary from the government that will help you for a few months. So a lot of uh, businesses laid off their people because that was the only thing that they could do. As as a little hotel uh, we, we had to decide whether we had three employees, we had to decide whether to send them home or keep them. So then that's also a responsibility that we have because they're like family, right? It's, you don't want to cause a bigger social problem here on the island. So we decided to keep them and pay them a, a 30 percent of their salary. And when we were locked down, of course, they didn't come to work. And then later on, when we were able to move around and they were able to come to the hotel, so they work 30% of the time, they get 30% of their salary, uh, at least to have food, uh, food and medicine. You know, that's, yes. that's what everybody needs right now in order not to cause a social problem of having that many people unemployed and maybe going to illegal activities. So that was our main concern as as private, you know, as, as the private sector. So that's what we did with our hotel. We, we kept our employees all this time. We just hope the economy and tourism gets better. I have a lot of friends in the U.S. that are senior citizens that they have already get their second shot. You oh, know, that's awesome. second Oh, so yeah. they're probably dying to come. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, it's, it's, yeah, little by little, it's, uh, I hope people is going to come down because, of course, you keep putting money from your savings in order 
to keep your business open. And right now what we're doing is putting a little bit less with the few reservations that we have. But yeah, there's always this decision whether you need to shut down and wait until everybody, everything recovers or you keep open in order to have the destination available for the few tourists that want to come. It's hard. It's been very hard. It's been very challenging. That sounds like an insanely emotional roller coaster, especially with employees. Like I've not been put in that position before, you know, the burden that that must be being a business owner for you and your mom. I'm sure that you two sat down with probably some strong margaritas <laughs> and like <laughs> weighed the pros yeah. and cons of, of what to do when, especially when that lockdown went, went down. And that's why I really wanted to take a moment for you to talk about that because there's so many of us like, we, you know, I lost my job, you know, I was laid off too, but I didn't own the business. And, but since I, you know, I come from a family of business owners and, you know, knowing friends like you, I can't judge anybody for that. It, like I was, I'm an expense. Like my position was an expense. And I completely understand like when the world is shutting down and you're in a tourism industry, like you got to make cuts. And so it's pretty incredible that not only did you keep your staff, you stayed open. And now hopefully you'll start reaping the benefits of that as well. Cause I know that when we were chatting yesterday, you had a friend coming in and you were going to be, you know, hanging out with her and she's going to be staying in the hotel and stuff. So you know, she wouldn't have a place to come if you didn't stay open. Yeah, exactly. Um, so tough decisions have been made with a lot of margaritas or yes. gin and tonics next to Gin and tonics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, I remember also lo- doing a lot of lobbying. You know, the first two months, mm. we were a lot of... That's when I, I, I realized that Zoom exists, you know, March of last year. <laughs> that's how out of technology... I usually happen to be. And uh, lobbying with a lot of authorities, you know, the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Tourism, the banks, because our reality as island that depends 100% of the tourism is totally different from realities of mainland where they have other type of industries, you know, and they, they are going back. Of course, not everybody goes back to their business 100%, but they have other ways to have uh, the economy rolling in the mainland. Here, no. So authorities were making decisions without considering that islands like the Galapagos are totally different. We're not going to recover in the next, well, it's going to be already a year, at least in another year. So we were saying, we need two years to recover. While they were thinking, okay, in the mainland, in one year, everything is going to be uh, up and going. So that was hard and it's still hard because they don't get it. They don't get it and our local authorities are doing the best that they can. But how far you can really have those regulations tailor-made, you know, if you tailor-made for each destination is also complicated. So right now it's okay. Whoever is open, uh, you're getting tourists. We're getting a lot of Ecuadorians, you know, locals. Mm. But trying we're to get also out. getting... We're also getting, we're also getting uh, some uh, some people from the U.S. Our mainly uh, our market has been mainly people from the U.S. and uh, Canada. We're getting some Germans also. Yeah, we used to get a lot from the U.K., but of course they're very, very in, in a very bad situation right now. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear. So I'm I'm glad to hear that things are slowly starting to turn around. And that's awesome. Um, so does it take it? So let, let's hop back in history now. So like we're all caught up yeah. on today and I'm sure we'll touch on it again because why not? It's so like in our face right now, the very now that's going on, but let's go back in time. So you were born and raised on the islands. Is that correct? I was born in Quito and I moved here to the islands when I was uh, nine years old. Mm. And then I did my school and high school over here on the islands. Oh, nice. And what was it that brought your family from mainland to Galapagos? I'm pretty sure that was a pretty big hop, right? Yes. So uh, my mom was uh, married with my dad at that time. And my mom was uh, an adventurous lady. And uh, she was, uh, when I was little, my first three or four years of life, we were living in the jungle. 
because they bought a big farm in order to take, uh, you know, to have cattle there and uh, to produce uh, vegetables and fruits. And uh, then that dream didn't last that long because my mother had to give birth of my sister after, yeah, in, in 86, 87. And we had a big earthquake that oh, destroyed wow. totally our farm. We were lucky enough that we were not there. We were in the mainland because my mom was giving birth. Otherwise, we would have died right away because the river changed the direction, the oil pipe uh, broke down. We had an oil pipe going through our property. So it was a mess. Wow. Uh, we were in Quito, living there and uh, in the big city. And I guess my mom never liked that idea of living in a big city. And then she got divorced with my dad and she was offered a job. All the cruise boats here have an office in town that is doing the paperwork, the supplies. And she was offered a position and she decided to come over here with uh, her two little girls. So I was nine and sister was seven, six at the time. And uh, since then we start, I mean, we've been living here in the Galapagos uh, all this time. So I did my school here, my all my school and my high school. And then I went to an exchange student program to the U.S. You know, I remember my mom brainwashing me since I was little, <laughs> saying, when you finish high school, you'll go to the U.S. to do an exchange student program as all your uncles and aunts uh, did. Wow. Uh, she did it as well. I mean, she didn't qualify for the, for, for, for the AFS, that was the, the company that we were using in order to do the exchange program. But she still was sent to a family member uh, on New York in order to learn English. So I did that. And as well, my sister did that. And after that, my mom said, uh, you know, I think you should go to Europe. Uh, we had some uh, an uncle that is the youngest brother of my mother and an aunt that she married an Italian long time ago. And you can go to Europe because we have an Italian passport. We're so lucky. Before my grandma died, my grandma said, you know, I don't have money to leave uh, to, to my kids or to my grandkids. But the thing that I would leave you, it will be the Italian passport because mm, wow. her dad was Italian. And she did 10 years of paperwork until finally she was able to get the passport. And then my mom was able to get the passport and we were able to get the passport. With the Italian passport, you just pretty much go, right? It's, it's very easy. So I went to Italy to study university. Uh, I was in the northern part, which was very cold for me. People was not that friendly. And <laughs> I've always wanted to be a naturalist guide. And I've always wanted to study tourism. I knew that, you know, I knew that before I even graduated from high school. So when I went to Italy, there was no university that was all offered hospitality. So I had mm -hmm. to take international business or international commerce, something like that. Something international of some sort. <laughs> something, yeah, with a lot of maths involved and a lot of physics involved. That I decided uh, after a year saying, you know, this is not my place. I don't feel happy. It's way too cold for me where I'm living. And I have to go back to my island. And hopefully wait for the training in order to become a naturalist guide. You know, that's what I wanted. So I came back after a year, year and a half being in Italy, and I started studying university in the mainland, in Guayaquil, in the coast, because I like hot weather. Yeah. So I say, I'm not going to Quito, which is a highland, which I'm going to be so cold. And because of cold weather, I already had enough in Italy. So I'm going to Guayaquil. And that's when I started studying university. It's uh, my degree, my bachelor's degree. It's uh, uh, hospitality, in uh, hospitality, hotel management, and uh, Tourism. That's uh, the degree that I got. And in, in the first year, the National Park here in the Galapagos opened the training to be a naturalist guide. So I stopped my university for a little bit. And then I came here to the islands, did my training and became a naturalist guide. And in that process, you know, I, I was going to a private university and I was running out of money to pay my university. So I had to, which was great. My university at that time, we were not by semesters. We were by bimesters. So every two months, we'll start and finish the classes. And they allowed me to study for four months. That will be two bimesters. And in those four months, I will do all my university year. 
So I was from seven in the morning till 10 p.m. at night, every single day in university for four months, doing what a regular person will do in one year. Whew. So I will study four months and come here to the Galapagos to guide eight months in order to be able to pay my university. And that's how I did it, you know. And then after four years and a half, I got my bachelor's degree in a, a hotel administration and tourism. So that's a little bit of my background, how I got involved with tourism. And I always wanted to have a little hotel. So that was my one of my projects at university to have a hotel and uh, the house that we had, my mom being alone, said it was way too big. I said, mom, why wouldn't you turn the house into a small hotel? And she says, okay. And then <clears throat> we built the hotel that we have now, like six rooms uh, on, our, uh, on our home, right? That's, uh, that's how we did it. And uh, of course, I, started, I, I kept on guiding. I've been already 15 years a naturalist guide. That's my main job and about 12 years or 10 years with a hotel wow that's awesome because i was going to ask yeah. you how the hotel came to be and you were great at already answering that question because <laughs> that's not something that i was able to ask you when i was there with you we got to visit i think we picked up towels clean towels or something when we were with you before we had margaritas with ceci and and we met your mother and she's just the cutest little thing and i was so glad that we got to visit that so Thank you for sharing how that came to be because that's so funny. You're such an, an ambitious woman. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> and I love knowing people like you. It's just so inspirational. So um, let, let's go back to your naturalist guiding. How, when did you decide in your, like, in your childhood, like what was your childhood like to know that that is a path you wanted to take? Because, and, and also, did you have any like, female heroes that you were looking up to that was doing that because just historically you know guiding and being a naturalist is usually a male dominant field so how did you decide to get into it what, was it your childhood or, or yeah what was it how did you get to it yeah over here being on an island and imagine at that time we hardly had to be we didn't have phones at home <laughs> when when we came to live here to the galapagos it was no cell phones available and landlines were were not available either. So I remember that you had to go to a place where you had like, like, like a cabin boots, where you had to go do a long line. I remember clearly, you know, in the hard weather at night and do the line in order to get the spot for you to get into the cabin booth and call the mainland. But because the connection was not that good, you could hear everything that six or seven people were talking at the same time. <laughs> it was not privacy at all. You know, and that had, hello, hello, yes, I'm here in the Galapagos. How are you doing? My mom used to call my grandma. So yeah, we're doing good. And uh, we need this or that. And my grandma will send us always a, once a month a package with things, you know, fruits, vegetables, or things that we were not able to find here on the island. So that's how, how isolated and how remote we were. We used to go to school, and in the afternoons, I used to play outside the whole time, you know, or, or I was at the ocean, or I was in my yard playing with friends all year long. And then when uh, we mature a little bit more in high school, my high school was right in the waterfront. So when we had the, the lunch time, we will have, you know, some 15, 20 minutes off that you will go to the cafeteria, get some snacks, but it was everything in the open. So you could see the group of tourists passing by with, of course, friends that you know that they were guides. So we always used to wave and we used to see this dynamic, right, of tourists going back and forth with friends and say, that's so cool. I want to be a guide. I would love to do that job. And then uh, before I graduate, my mom was working for one of the companies. And when she quit, they decided to give her two spots in order to go on a cruise. She could have sell it, you know, and, ha and make some money. Or she could have go uh, with whoever she wanted. So she said, you know, you and your sister have to go because, I, you, you know, you graduate, you're going abroad and... Who knows when you both are going to be together? 
by that time, me and my sister, like my sister and me, we were not good friends. I mean, I was <laughs> outgoing and my sister was always watching TV. So we didn't have friends in common. We didn't like to do things in common. So we said, okay, we're going to be stuck, both of us, for a whole week <laughs> on board of the boat. <laughs> and uh, I had the best week ever and my sister as well, you know. Uh, so I was a guest What you were, you know, when you came here. I was a guest and I had amazing naturalist guides. So I fall in love with the whole deal of leading groups on the islands. I was saying, that's so cool. You know, you have, you get to swim with the sea lions, you get to walk among marine iguanas and uh, you get to eat very delicious food. You don't have to wash dishes because everything is served. <laughs> and and no, I, I really think our guides at that time, our expedition leaders at that time, they played an important role on us. Uh, and that's what make us love this type of job. That's why we're nature lovers. They did an outstanding job. So I said, you know, I want to be like them. I want to be like them because it's, it's a dream. Out in nature, being active, and uh, leading trips and, and I mean, leading people, trying to, to explain nature, just facilitate nature, you know, between nature and the guest, you are there. So that's when I decided to become a guide. So before finishing my high school, I already knew I wanted to be a guide. And then, you know, I went to the United States, I went to Italy, and I had to wait five years from the graduation time of high school until I was able to become a guide because they don't offer the trainings every year they usually offer every four or five years according to the need or, and how many guides the, the the islands need and that's when and since then i still enjoy what i do you know it's it's great my office every day changes right <laughs> yes i just remember your beautiful voice coming on to the speakers in the morning and waking all of us up. And it was like the sweetest thing just to wake up to you every morning, like, hola, good morning. <laughs> Time to wake up. Time to wake up. <laughs> Time to wake yeah. up. Um, Cause we, you were already up and we were planning another beautiful expedition on some amazing island. And oh my gosh, just thinking about it right now really wants me to really want to get on a plane and come like right now. <laughs> Come um, because everything is almost fifty percent off. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's very true. That's, that's actually a really good point. Everyone listening, we went when the time's right. Go to the Galapagos. <laughs> yes. Um, and also, I was so when I was on that trip, I was quite blessed to have you, Sessi, and Zappa. So um, to have two female guides and one male guide. Um, and so from, I, I'm just curious, just. Like I said, in, in traveling in a whole bunch of different places around the world where guiding and being a naturalist is a male-dominated field, do you still, do you see that same ratio in the Galapagos Islands? Is it mainly uh, males there too, and you're the exception? Um, and if so, is that starting to change? Is it starting to balance out? Or um, what are you seeing? Yeah, you know, I, here is not the exception. Yeah, it's a male-dominant field. I really don't know the percentage. That would be something that for sure the National Park knows. But yeah, I, I remember when I was a guest, four of the guides, all of them were males. So like you have high chances to get a male guide here on the islands. But the girls that we are, we are we're very, very brave, very tough to get there. And we can do the same job or even better than, than the males. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Even though we had uh, uh, some conversations that still, you know, in South America, we still live in a male dominant culture. So women like us, uh, it's a little bit harder to prove that you can do the same job or even better. It takes time, right? It takes you more effort, which I hope, I hope things will change at some point because of this male dominant uh, uh, idea that all South America has. But uh, yeah, we're here. I mean, if I would have to go back and choose what I wanted to do again, 
I will know, I have no doubt of being a guy. Also, when we're on board, uh, uh, we are usually one naturalist guide on board, and then you have 11 crew members, and all of them are boys, and you are the only female on board of the boat. So at some point, a very, and well, for me, it was not hard because we, we lived only girls, you know, my mom, my sister, and me. So we were very independent, very self sufficient, very tough when it needed to be. So for me, it's not complicated to deal with 11 or 10 crew members uh, because of my personality. You know, it's like they know that uh, I'm independent and I like to, to have the things done right. And most of the people knows my mom as well, and they know how strict and how firm she is. So they know, okay, this is the same as as jo, uh, Mama Josie's, or is even worse, <laughs> you know? So yeah. we have a history of being very tough ladies here on the islands. But yeah, I will not change it for anything. That's wonderful. No, there was no question whether or not you were in charge when we were on the boat, which was awesome. Now we had so much fun. So on, on that note then, so since um, the islands are, like you said, tourism is 80% of the jobs. So for the other women that don't pursue guiding, what are some opportunities for um, the other women on the islands? What do they usually go into? Here, you know, we have uh, uh, ladies working in the public institutions. We have ladies working the field. Even if you are a, a female, you still can do any job. Like all the jobs that boys do, girls have to do it. Because that's the only thing, you know, there is no other option. And then uh, some other percentage will stay at home and take care of the kids. Like, as you know, in South America, we have this big problem of girls getting pregnant early in their lives and then having to take care of three, four, five kids. And uh, then they'll have to stay at home. That's, uh, that's what we do. But uh, we do have, uh, for example, the Ministry of Tourism. Right now, it's, in, it's, it's lead by a female. Oh, wow. So we do have institutions that the higher positions are also led by, by girls, which is, which is great. It's great. So it sounds like there's, there's a wave coming through, you know, slowly but surely, powerful, yeah. independent women like you are starting. To, and also, too, like, that's an inspiration for the next generation. So if I'm sure there's little kids on the islands that know you, know you and your mom, your sister, and they're like, oh, I want to be like them. Like, look at them. They're crushing it. They are independent. They're going around the islands. You know, they have their own business and they're still open even during these times. So I'm sure that you're, I mean, you inspire me. I, I don't even get to live with you. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, living here, it's, it's it's a for me it's a big responsibility uh for because galapagos have gave us so much to my family so i'm i feel the need and i'm i mean for me it's mandatory to give back to the islands what the islands have give me all these years so i'm always in you know a part of guiding and helping my mom with the hotel I'm uh, very involved with different projects here in the community. Like uh, we have our guides association. Uh, we had uh, this amazing project that guides like 20 years ago, they thought and they saw the need of having a library in town. So those previous guides that right now they are retired, they were able to raise funds and build a library here in town at that time, you know, 20 years ago or more. And then that library was given to the municipality to, to, for them to administrate and run it. Things didn't go that well there. So these few eight years, seven years uh, after I came back from my master degree in Spain, um, we, we became part of the board of directors of this guide association with another friend. And our main goal was to get back the library to our control, to the guides association, because we didn't have the we didn't want the municipality 
to keep having it and having it closed and not uh, uh, doing what they were supposed to do. So that took us several years to get the library back. And uh, the new board of directors, when we gave them already, you know, we had to change directors. So we say, hey, here's the library. Now we have to open it, you know, find funds in, in order to make it work. So this other group of friends were amazing and they were able to, to get funds in order to have the only public library in the Galapagos open and running. So, you know, all that activity also, it's time consuming. Uh, before, you, uh, you know, you were guiding with no signal, you were in town, you had to take care of your family, uh, do things because uh, you wanted the library to at some point be open. So in between, we squeeze that social responsibility that we have with our islands. So now that is running, you know, um, uh, and as hotels, as a hotel also, we have the social responsibility with, uh, with a little school of children with special needs, but also with the library. So, you know, right now, in order to have more books coming to our, our project, every reservation that gets into our hotel, we send a message saying, you know, we are part of this project. If you want to bring a book, two, three or ten, whatever fits on your luggage, we'll be so happy to have them. And here's the wish list on Amazon. So that's how we get books as well to have it in our library. So that's one of the things that in my free time uh, I was doing in the library for Galapagos. I wish at my time when I was little, I would have a place to go and read. So with, I don't have the habit of reading. I mean, I do read. It takes me a lot of time. But because we didn't have that space or that habit of going to a place where you can find nice books and read, right? So we want to encourage that to the new generation, right, in, in, in that project, in that regards, regards. And then also because of the hotel, I'm involved in the Chamber of Tourism, in the Board of Directors for the hotel area. And there is, you know, a lot of meetings, a lot of lobbying, because the main goal is to, to have the, an excellent service and to put all of the hotels at the same level. So that takes a lot of my time as well. Well, right now, I have plenty of time to do all this. <laughs> yes. but in a, Too much in time, right? Time, I, <laughs> too much time, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, on, on a regular time, I will squeeze in time also to, to do that. So yeah, there is, there is always a lot of things to do here on the islands, a lot of things. And that's how you get to know people. And going back to what you're saying, yeah, you meet people and they see you working and, you see, uh, and they see you helping the community. And uh, hopefully you are a, a good role model for them, right? To be an inspiration to whatever they want to do. It's amazing. God, girl. And I'm just thinking, because when you were full-time guiding, we were going around the islands, like we were completely disconnected for days at a time. And it's just amazing that you were still found time being a full-time guide from being completely disconnected, not even having a, a phone signal of any sort and still able to contribute as much as you did. And well, and you still do, um, is mind-blowing. It's incredible. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.